very much. Nothing happened. Everything is good. Thank you. It's okay. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just going to make on the top. Okay. Quite good there, I like it. It's good cool. advice. Yeah. There is a grain, it's called grain, I think. It's like a coffee place close to the station, the main station. Ah, okay. And it's nice there, you can get a lot of spices, coffee, <laughs> whatever. So. Yeah, I'll leave that for you and I'll have fun. How do you find the comments? Yeah, that's all right so far. Yeah. Uh, and we've been getting a slow line across. Yeah. But the slow line is the one that went so far in. Yeah, it's far in it. Yeah, but I've always got a seat and a table seat. Yeah, yeah. 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 This is uh, technology innovation. Uh, we're going to focus in commercial aviation because it's, uh, it has the most interest and affects our lives uh, yearly. We, we take a plane to go to vacation, uh, for work, and uh, it has a lot of interest in terms of uh, how safety has improved thanks to technology and also the high stakes of technology in avionics because uh, it's not just your ordinary uh, everyday service or program that can just like fail in any way and you won't care much, it's going to be an annoyance. The, if that happens in aviation, it could cost hundreds of lives. So that's, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, differences uh, writing software or implementing a, a system architecture in uh, avionics in aviation. First, a bit of history uh, for commercial aviation. Uh, it started in 1914. Uh, the first uh, commercial flight was uh, between St. Petersburg and Tampa, Florida. It lasted 29 minutes. Uh, then uh, in 1919, uh, KLM uh, was formed, um, the, the, the airline that exists even today. It's uh, the oldest airline in the world. And uh, had regular service between Amsterdam and London. Uh, in 1929, the, the Warsaw Convention uh, set the, the rules about passenger rights and all the rules that uh, govern the civil aviation. Uh, in uh, 1935, Pan Am, Pan American, the, the most well-known uh, uh, company uh, for commercial aviation that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, uh, did the first uh, Trans-Pacific flight with uh, seaplanes and uh, multiple stops along the way in small uh, Pacific Islands to, to refuel and stuff. 
And uh, 1945, IATA was founded. It was uh, it's the organization that 85% of the world's uh, airlines belong to. It's uh, it governs the, the rules and procedures about commercial aviation. Um, in 1970, Boeing 747, the jumbo jet, was uh, entered service. Uh, it was a major uh, uh, step uh, in long range flights. It had the, the range to be able to accomplish right from the U.S. Uh, all the way to Asia or uh, uh, from Europe to Tokyo, for example, that we, we couldn't accomplish before that uh, without having stops in between. Before uh, moving any further, I need to explain some things about uh, how how planes are controlled. Uh, here we see the, the three the three axes that uh, uh, planes uh, are, are controlled with. Uh, we have the longitudinal axis uh, that controls the roll. When this plane, uh, it's usually the, the way that planes turn, change direction in the sky, they roll. Uh, we have the the lateral axis which controls speeds, uh, nose up, nose down, ascend and descend. And we have the, the vertical axis side that uh, controls yo, uh, which usually is just to, to compensate and stabilize the plane. Uh, and it, it may be used uh, at, at the last uh, stage uh, before landing to, to line up with uh, the runway. Well, you don't want to, 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 to roll because you're, you're very low, but you want to like change a bit of your direction. And uh, let's see the, the flight surfaces on a plane that actually control those uh, axes. Uh, we have what we call the primary flight controls, which are the, the most important. Uh, you need those uh, controls to be able to, to actually fly a plane. Uh, Let's start with the ailerons that uh, control the roll. Um, and uh, the, the ones that are used uh, usually are the ones uh, on the most outboard part of the wing. But uh, there, there, there are also the spoilers that can act, uh, act as ailerons, but uh, they're only used as ailerons uh, for backup uh, reasons. Normally, they're just used as uh, air brakes to, to cut airspeed because they, they tend to, to induce a lot more drag to accomplish the same thing as the ones that uh, reside uh, outboard of the wing. Then we have the elevators that actually control the pitch and uh, the rudders that uh, control the yaw. Then we have things like flaps and slats uh, that uh, actually change the, the size of the wing, they extend the wing and uh, they provide more lift uh, in uh, situations like uh, takeoff and landing but we want uh, more lift than uh, normal. Of course, they, they induce more drag, uh, so that's why we, we don't want them uh, all, uh, extend, extended all the time while they're cruising. Uh, otherwise, we're going to burn a lot more fuel uh, and probably we're going to lose a lot of range. Uh, let's see a bit about uh, the, the first jets and uh, the technology they had. Um, the first jet that made aviation uh, very popular again with uh, Pan American, it was the Boeing 707. Uh, it wasn't the first jet and air airliner, there were a few before it, but that was the most popular. And uh, it is also the, the airplane that the Boeing 737 is based on, that uh, it even flies uh, today. Uh, it had fully mechanical controls of all flight surfaces. Um, so. Uh, from the cockpit, to the, the pilot control would uh, have steel cables attached to it, extended all the way to the tail and the wings, controlling the, the surfaces we saw before. Um, the steel cables would, ha would have pulleys, uh, dy dynamometers to, to control all those surfaces. Uh, the, the autopilot it was like uh, pretty damp, it was able to just do very, very simple things, control the roller pits. And uh, in most cases, uh, it couldn't even change mode. For example, you could uh, set the autopilot to start descending, but then you would have to stop it from uh, keep descending. It couldn't uh, just reach a certain altitude and stop descending level off. You had to change the mode manually. Um, so, uh, and, and everything uh, in the cockpit was analog. Uh, a lot of goggles with uh, needles, uh, so you have to scan a lot of, uh, of things to, to figure out what's going on with the plane. Um, so, pretty limited technology. Of course, um, 
Uh, with that limited technology, we, we had a lot of uh, safety issues. Although there's, uh, today there's tens of millions of flights every year and the aviation is very safe. Back in the day, especially between 60s and 80s, that uh, the commercial aviation became popular in the jet age. Um, we had a lot of accidents. Uh, most of them had to do with uh, design flaws because the design uh, wasn't possible to be tested in simulation back then. So uh, you, you had some limited testing, but uh, when the airplane was in service, uh, new problems and uh, issues would come up and uh, design flaws that uh, couldn't be predicted and accidents would happen. Parts failures because we, we didn't understand uh, properly the materials and how uh, they interact with uh, certain environments. For example, uh, we, we didn't know how a, a, an environment that's uh, close to sea, due to the sea salt, it would uh, corrode uh, way faster than usual. Uh, Hawaiian uh, figured that out uh, the hard way. Um, Weather, we discovered a lot of weather phenomena that we weren't aware of, like microbus and wind shear that can take a plane down if, uh, and we didn't even know that they existed or how to detect them uh, back then. And uh, by far the largest cause, of course, uh, human error, the human factor, it wasn't uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, predictable behavior or how humans understood uh, what was happening uh, to a plane and how they reacted. Uh, sometimes uh, doing the wrong things and causing the plane to crash. But uh, there were improvements from uh, all those lessons learned, from all the accidents, the investigations that happened uh, afterwards, uh, new rules, uh, what to do to avoid uh, all those issues, uh, better materials that uh, we stand uh, uh, wear and tear in the environment way better, along with uh, better manufacturing processes that uh, would uh, strengthen those materials and uh, uh, help out with a lot of uh, manufacturing flows that we had in the past. And of course, better training of the pilots and uh, crew management on, on how the, the two pilots interact with each other and how they manage the task and the workload that they had to deal with. Yet accidents still happened, uh, and again, due to the human factor. That was something very hard to control. So the, the idea came of uh, using technology as a tool to, to improve safety in aviation. Um, and that was to, to minimize the human error uh, by adding uh, safeguards that could, uh, could stop the pilots from making a grave mistake and um, by filtering the controls uh, that pilots exercise on the, the plane. And of course, uh, another major thing to, to alert the report uh, uh, probably what was happening with the plane at any time, so the pilot could have uh, could make uh, informed decisions on how to react. This happened with uh, what's called uh, fly-by-wire. It was a revolutionary advancement uh, for commercial aviation. It was introduced by Airbus uh, in 1988 with the Airbus A320, a very popular uh, narrow-body plane. Um, what happened with uh, fly-by-wire? It was uh, the, the replacement of steel wiring from the controls to the control surface of the plane with uh, electric wires that transfer, transfer in electric signals that gave us the, the ability to, to actually uh, intercept uh, the control input and uh, augment it and instead of, uh, of uh, sending directly the, the controlling the surface directly, uh, take into consideration the various inputs from uh, sensors and uh, deciding what's the best uh, action, or how to move the control surfaces to accomplish what the pilot wants. Uh, to do that, we have uh, multiple computer systems uh, translating uh, the inputs to, to actual movement of uh, control surfaces. And of course, with uh, fly-by-wire, glass cockpits co were introduced, which is uh, digital displays in the cockpit that uh, centralize all the information and uh, they're, they're easier to, to read, uh, they're augmented in the information they provide instead of scanning uh, multitudes of codes with needles to figure out uh, what's going on. Uh, let's see how that, uh, how fly-by-wire actually co controls the, the inputs. Uh, it's what Airbus uh, calls uh, flight envelope, which is a set of rules that govern the, the aircraft operation limits and dampens the control input that would cause uh, major issues, uh, uh, translate to, to very bad outcomes. For example, 
uh, it wouldn't let you pitch the, the plane all the way nose down because uh, there's no reason to do that. After, after a certain point, the plane is in free fall and uh, will uh, surpass its uh, uh, structure and uh, aerodynamic limits and uh, disintegrate in air. Um, to, to accomplish that, uh, the flight envelope has uh, a lot of uh, flight laws that govern the, the level of controls that uh, the computer systems have. Um, it has the normal law with multiple modes, the alternate laws, and the direct law. Let's say a bit about uh, what the, the normal law is and uh, what uh, kind of modes it has. The normal law has uh, three modes. Um, the ground mode, which is, uh, as its name, it's active on the ground. Uh, behaves uh, like the plane is in direct control uh, by, uh, by the pilots with very minimal protections. And uh, that is because uh, during takeoff, uh, you need uh, to actually uh, apply all the control you, you want uh, to, to be able to take off the ground. So ha having uh, limitations there it was a bad, it would be a bad decision. Of course, that mode uh, transitions to, to the normal uh, to the normal mode, flight mode, uh, once uh, the plane is off the ground. The flight mode is uh, where all the interesting stuff happens uh, with fly by wire. Uh, it governs the majority of the flight uh, from gears up all the way to before that's down for landing. It provides a lot of protections um, that uh, improves the safety of, uh, of aviation. Uh, pitch protection, for example, as I mentioned, you, you can't just like pitch all the way nose down. Uh, it won't allow you, although you, you may go all the way forward and try to do that, it won't allow you to do that because after, after a, certain, uh, a certain rate of descent, uh, you, you will damage the plane, so there's no point in allowing that. Uh, also the same with uh, nose up attitude. Uh, if you do that, you're going to end up stalling the plane and it's going to fall off the sky like a brick. Uh, it has what it's called uh, load factor protection, which uh, load factor is, is the, the power of, uh, of gravity uh, that's exerted on the plane. Uh, usually it's going to be 1G, uh, but uh, you, when you turn, it can go up 1.3G and uh, the, uh, up to a maximum of 2.5G. So when you reach that maximum, uh, it will stop you from uh, increasing that load. Otherwise, you're going to tear the plane apart and uh, going to disintegrate. Uh, bank angle protection, uh, when it rolls, it won't allow to go after a specific point. Otherwise, you may roll the plane, which is very bad. You don't want that to ever happen. And the most important uh, protection, which uh, had to do with a lot of accidents in the past and uh, even today, if you don't have the protection, uh, stall protection, which uh, is uh, the situation where your plane uh, is, is going uh, too slow uh, to, to produce enough lift to stay in the air so it falls down, uh, like a brick again. Or if uh, you, you raise the nose, so the, your, your pitch attitude a lot, to the point where the, the air stream is interrupted and uh, no, lift, no lift is produced anymore, so you fall uh, out of the sky as well. Um, then uh, overspeed protection, um, after a certain speed, the plane uh, will not be able to withstand the aerodynamic forces and the structural uh, integrity of the plane is going to be compromised. So uh, there's a protection for that as well. It will stop you from uh, exceeding the limit. Let's see how, how that happens. Uh, there's a demo here in the video that uh, demonstrates those protections. So uh, now we see here that uh, turning, pulling the stick back, trying to, to raise the nose very much is going to stall the plane eventually. Uh, so the, the flight envelope protection in the flight mode uh, will stop you from doing that. It will detect that uh, you, 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 you have a pitch attitude to, 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 that it's too much and will cause a stall. So it will lower the nose for you and increase rust uh, to the engines to prevent you from stalling. Then uh, we have the bank angle protection. Once you reach the max and uh, you insist of uh, keeping the plane there, uh, 
the envelope protection will uh, get uh, your, your plane back to, to level flight. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, the overspeed protection. Uh, let's say you, you go nose down with uh, full throttle. Uh, you, you're going to reach a very high speed above the, the limit that will start uh, putting the plane at risk. The envelope protection will uh, get the nose up uh, as required to, to cut the speed of the plane. And that's about it. Uh, okay, so um, yes, and uh, the, th the third uh, mode of the normal law is uh, the flare mode, uh, which is uh, the mode that gets activated uh, 100 feet above ground when you go in for landing, and uh, it, it removes some of the protections and uh, just restricts two things, the, the angle of the attack you can have, so you, you don't touch with the nose, uh, with the tail first on the ground, and uh, the bank angle, so you don't hit the wings on the, the runway. And uh, of course, trims uh, the aircraft nose down, so the, the default attitude of the plane will be nose down when you leave the controls, so the plane sticks to the ground once you land. Then we have uh, what it's, it's called alternate laws. Those laws uh, go into effect once uh, uh, it's not possible to keep the normal law anymore, and that will happen where there are failures on uh, redundant systems, as, uh, as I told you, the, the, the fly-by-wire system uh, uses computers to, call, to do all those things. So once uh, you, you have a failure, you, you lose some of your systems, uh, it will have uh, garbage data as input, so if it makes decisions for you, to protect you, it, the, those decisions will be very bad because the, the data is not reliable. Garbage in, garbage out pretty much. So instead of uh, doing that, it switches to, to an alternate law, um, which uh, of course you, you will lose a lot of protection because it, it can't really know what's happening with the plane anymore. So if, uh, it, it will keep some protections like the load factor limit, but uh, you will get uh, direct control of the plane in terms of roll, and um, of course you will have to do a lot of more things manually, uh, the turn coordination, because when you, you turn, when you run the, run the plane to, to turn, you, you will also go down, so you need to apply some uh, rudder control to, to keep it on uh, the level flight you're in, so you don't lose uh, altitude. Um, that happens automatically in a fly-by-wire plane, but uh, when you lose uh, the normal low, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, and of course, you, you only get some minimal uh, stolen overspeed protections. It will try to, to lower the nose or uh, raise the nose for stolen uh, or overspeed, uh, respectively. But uh, the pilot can, uh, can override that by just uh, using the control. It's not forced to you anymore because uh, the, the plane is not certain that uh, what it's, it's actually doing is the right thing because uh, it has failures in its systems or uh, the input from the sensors is not uh, reliable anymore. And then there's also the, the alternate load too. This is uh, way worse than the first one. If, uh, if the plane a a is in a state that can't really make sense of what's happening anymore, for example, for some reason you end up like that, it will just uh, remove all control and uh, pretty much give you back uh, full control to the pilot. So you, 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 you're, uh, it's, it's like uh, you're, you're in control, uh, do what needs to be done. You understand better what's happening right now. I can't understand anymore what's happening. And uh, of course, it reverts back to some mechanical controls as well. Uh, the, the yaw that uh, has a mechanical backup. And uh, last but not least, uh, there's the direct law. This one uh, happens when uh, multiple critical systems fail. Um, 
and uh, the, the direct control from the pilot uh, goes to, to the control surface of the plane, one-to-one -one as it is. You have zero protections, and uh, at most you get some uh, oral warnings for uh, stolen overspeed, but that's it. It's like you're flying uh, an old mechanical plane. You, you have absolute control. But th that's for the best, because at that point, the, the fly-by-wire system computers can't really understand uh, what's right, what's wrong. Let's see a bit of, uh, of the architecture of the fly-by-wire system. This specific one is uh, of the Airbus A320. Uh, as we can see, we have the, the side sticks of the pilots and the pedals that uh, control uh, roll, pitch, and yaw, and uh, also the, the rudder trim. Uh, they can uh, trim the rudder to a specific position uh, to compensate uh, for an engine out or things like that. First of all, we have uh, the, the flight augmentation computers that uh, take input from uh, sensors like uh, uh, IDU, which uh, gives data about uh, the inertia and the internal reference of the plane. So it knows uh, where the plane is uh, compared to the horizon, if it's rolling, it's basically a very advanced uh, gyrometer that uh, understands the position of the plane in the air. Um, so it can make decisions if you're on level flight or not, or uh, in, a, in, a, in a high attitude, uh, if it's up nose. And uh, based on those decisions, controls the rudder. Then we have the, the, the ailerons, uh, the elevators and ailerons uh, computers. That's, uh, th those are the, the most main control surfaces of the airplane. Um, it's a set of them that controls, uh, co controls the ailerons and the elevators. Uh, the ailerons control the roll and the elevators control the pitch. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, the spoilers and uh, elevators computer that controls the spoilers, which uh, mostly during a normal flight they're used for uh, uh, breaking the, the airplane by causing additional drag. And uh, that they are mostly as backup uh, if the, the primary uh, lag computer fails. There's something that's wrong with the spoiler, is it called the spoiler alert? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, let's see a bit about uh, how those uh, computers are structured. Um, there are two uh, fly, uh, flight recommendation computers that they are actually master master and each of those computers uh, is actually a, a set of other uh, of computers that uh, performs a simple uh, thing like one of them controls and the other monitors it's a closed feedback loop so um, the pilot will give a command uh, the computer will, will augment that command based on the, the current situation of the plane and the, the input from the sensors uh, like uh, airspeed uh, um, reference point uh, of what state the airplane is in and uh, will we'll give appropriate command to, to the control surfaces to accomplish what the pilot wants and then uh, the control surfaces have sensors that actually can uh, can give back feedback uh, to the monitor uh, part of the set that will like uh, ver verify if uh, the commands the control uh, part gave actually were accomplished correctly and uh, we'll take appropriate action based on that. If it fails to do it, uh, we'll see about that uh, a bit more uh, later on. As I said, the, the, the two major sensor inputs uh, that uh, a, a modern uh, fly-by-wire airplane has uh, are uh, three sensors uh, for, uh, that are called ADIRU. It's uh, inertia and data reference information, which uh, keeps the horizon and uh, uh, on what state the plane is compared to the horizon. And uh, the other one, pilot tubes that uh, actually measure the, measure the airspeed. It's important to know if uh, you want to know if the plane is stolen, if it's going fast enough, so in, if, if it's not going fast enough at all. Um, those, uh, those sensors are in triplicate, and uh, for the input to, to actually be trustworthy, to be taken into account by the computers, it needs to, to have a quorum, so at least from each set of sensors, you need at least two, two of them agreeing to, to be taken into account. Otherwise, uh, it considers that the, the data that it's taking is garbage. 
And of course, uh, the, the 2FAC computers, uh, if, if they fail, uh, they, they just uh, fail back to, to a mechanical system that exists to, to control the rudder. But of course, uh, if that happens, uh, you, you lose a very important function of uh, that system. The, that system uh, that controls the rudder of the vertical stabilizer keeps the, the plane in stable flight. Uh, and uh, if, if that uh, is lost, then you, the, the pilots have to, to do that manually, which is uh, a huge workload for a pilot. It, it, they need to constantly trim that to, to keep the plane uh, flying stable. And also, if uh, there's a failure, like uh, an edging out situation, where the, 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 the drag uh, will increase uh, from the side that the engine failed, and you're going to have uh, an issue like the plane is going to start rolling towards the side. Um, Normally, with that system working, uh, it will automatically compensate and keep the, the, the plane flying level without the pilots having to do anything uh, different. Uh, you lose that if that doesn't work. Then uh, the, the most major system, uh, the ELAC computers, uh, there are two, again, active-to-active, uh, they take input from the, the, the triplicate of the two main sensors uh, for inertia and airspeed. They control the role in the pits uh, and uh, the, the computers that uh, are active uh, uh, mostly because those are the two things that uh, the pilots use uh, to, to control the plane. It's again a control and monitor set and uh, as I said, the, the close feedback loop checks for uh, the commanded action if uh, the outcome uh, was as expected. And, uh, in case of failure of uh, one of the two computers, it will fail over to the other one and continue. Uh, but uh, in case of both failing, then uh, we have a failover to, to, to the triplicate set of uh, SEC computers that controls the spoilers and elevators. Which uh, the, there are three, three of them. They're always active and uh, they're actually sharing tasks. Um, the spoilers uh, they have uh, that we control, it's a triplicate set. Um, one, uh, one on each side of the plane on uh, each wing. So the one set will control the, the two outboard, the two, one, another one will control the set of the two middle of the wing, and uh, the last one, the import of the wing. So if one fails, uh, the other will still have a balance of control, otherwise it won't be able to like turn and, uh, and uh, get the plane back to, to stable flight. If, uh, if one of, uh, of those fails, uh, its, its state of the control surfaces of the spoilers reverts back to, to the normal state, so they get uh, retracted back, so they don't affect the, the, the plane flying, and uh, the rest of them will, uh, will keep controlling. Uh, you, you will lose a bit of control. It will be harder to, to roll, but uh, you will still be able to do that. Now, the, all, that, uh, all those computers uh, are prone to suffering from what it's called uh, common mode failures, uh, where uh, you, you may have a, a hardware bug in the CPU for the specific architecture. We've seen that even in our personal computers with the CPUs driving uh, fl floating point operation bugs and uh, microcode updates, if possible, to, to fix that. So uh, if, if you run similar software, and you do this, uh, similar operations, they may fail both at the same time, although they're separate computers, because they, they run the same faulty hardware with uh, the same bug, can have a common mode uh, failure, which is bad, you don't want that in a plane. So to avoid that, flight by wire systems use uh, dif different kind of CPUs on its uh, computer, on its set. So you may have one computer that uh, x86 architecture, another one that's PowerPC, Another one that's uh, Motorola 68K and uh, etc. Uh, so you avoid the, in hardware those uh, common mode failure operations, uh, situations like that. And of course, uh, in software, where you if you deploy the same software and you have the same bug, you, you can end up on the same common mode failure. To avoid that, uh, each computer uh, runs a separate software implementation. Uh, that uh, has nothing to do with each other. It's like uh, that it's developed by uh, completely different teams that share nothing. So it, it's very unlikely that uh, both teams will, will implement uh, something the same way. 
that they just get a list of requirements and they have to implement that. So they, they will probably may have a bug, but it will be on different things, so they, they won't fail uh, both of them at the same time. And the good thing with uh, have the controlled uh, feedback loop, you, you, it knows that uh, actually the, the computer didn't uh, ha has a bug and it, it couldn't manage to, to do what uh, it expected to do. So it, it, it takes itself out of the, the equation. It con considers itself failed and uh, just abandons operations. And of course, uh, there are separate power and data lanes for each computer. So if the power is cut, um, either uh, due to short circuit or uh, physically for uh, if something happens to the plane, uh, they don't all go out of operation at the same time. And uh, also separated physically and sealed it uh, so they don't get fried by, by thunder, lightning strike. Uh, so they continue working. If, even if one fails, you you have the backup working. Yes. The quantum software they duplicate the quantum software as well. Hmm? Basically, you may you mentioned that they duplicate the I don't yes. know the sec or the control software, but the quantum the software that decides okay this software give me this response and this software give me that response, I'm going to. How the current software works? Do you know? Well, uh, the the ones that have uh, it, the computers that are in triplicate mm -hmm. can actually have a quorum because two, if two of them uh, agree, then they have a quorum. And the, the one that doesn't agree uh, is not taken into consideration. Yeah, but my point is, they it, sh it should be a, a software that uh, uh, says, okay, this software give me this output. This software give me this output. I I'm going to do the quorum. Is yes. How is another software, or is a is an a low level? No, no. They 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 are aware of each other and they vote. Ah, okay. So they know that they're gonna communicate with each other. Okay. They have a specification and they know that uh, okay. hey, I think th this needs to happen. I think this needs to happen. Do they match? No. What's the okay. quorum? They decide between them. Okay. And also in cases where you don't have a triplicate, uh, that's why they have the control feedback loop. Uh, an action happens, uh, the feedback is not as expected. It, it tries either to correct first, it will try to correct it, or uh, it will just fail hard and fail over to, to the next computer. Mm -hmm. So, the, the software that runs in avionics uh, has to follow a specific standard called uh, TO178B, which specifies the development processes and objectives in uh, avionics software. Uh, this uh, standard defines five uh, development assurance levels, so uh, you, you don't have to follow exactly the same uh, strict regulations. Uh, for example, as you can see, we have A, B, C, D. Uh, if, if you're uh, writing software for your for the in-flight detainment system, you fall under the the e section. You you have no effect on aircraft operations or workload, so you you don't have to follow the same strict rules as uh, software that has. Uh, catastrophic failure condition for the aircraft if it fails. They're, they're totally different things. So, uh, depending on uh, the kind of software you, you, you're writing for avionics, uh, you, you have to follow a separate uh, path and set of rules. Uh, th those, those are very, very, a lot of uh, specifications that you have to follow and waste, that, like hundreds of pages each, but we, we see a, a general at the end overview of all those. Uh, all tools that uh, are used in development of avionics software need to be certified, and the most important thing needs to be to have deterministic outcomes. So, uh, otherwise, there's there's no way to be to ever be certified for avionics because if you don't know what's going to happen in any case, it's something you don't want on an airplane. Uh, for example, uh, ADA is a very popular language with avionics software because it provides us that. Um, C++ can be used, but only a small subset of it, if you chose to use it. Uh, for example, things like polymorphism and all that can be used. Anything that uh, makes uh, your software not deterministic can be used. Uh, I'm assuming the same for things uh, like uh, pro probably Scala would be disqualified because uh, it has a JVM. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it, it's not, you, you don't want uh, your, your avionic software to have a memory exception or uh, <laughs> be late to, to do something. Or, uh, sorry, I'm garbage collecting, I can't control the plane right now. <laughs> do you know if they are using Scala? 
Yes, I do. Yes, it's it's very very popular. Not only avionics, but also in uh, train I'm operations. A for for yes. I don't think I programming with Ada in the past, and I don't think it's the same mistake. No, no, the, the, there is a specific uh, certified set of okay, that uh, actually works. It's usually and a lot of as things you said, that... Uh, we can get uh, a specific <laughs> kind of a Scala. And it can be the JPM <laughs> the, the would disqualify Scala in every, any language that has a VM uh, that can carry the proper management of memory. It's uh, well, automatically you know disqualified. Do you know announcement to do a Scala native? Yes, but uh, I'm sure uh, that by then you, you, you go through so, so many transformations and the tooling that you use can really be certified uh, that uh, has deterministic outcomes. Because today you may compile it and uh, be like that, tomorrow it may be something different, you don't want that. So the, the software design process uh, requirements uh, are, uh, are things like uh, that you have to specify how the software satisfies the high level requirements. So you have to list all your algorithms that you're using, how exactly they work, the data structures, the allocation of processors and tasks that your software is gonna do to, to accomplish the, the high level requirements. Um, it, it, it's a lot of uh, properly um, calculated process of development that you have to follow to accomplish that, to be certified. Uh, you have to describe the architecture that defines the, the software structure to implement those requirements. It needs to be very specific uh, how it works. All the inputs and outputs, uh, um, you, you have to, to demonstrate all the data flow and uh, control flow that's happening in your architecture. As I said, to, to be deterministic, you have to, to actually uh, showcase that. For, for, for every case, what's going to happen, where the data is going to go, and uh, how, how the flow of, of, of logic happens. Uh, of course, you, you also need to manage uh, the resources and the limitations of uh, the system it's going to run on. So you have to, to demonstrate uh, how you, your software is aware of the margins um, of uh, the resources, CPU for processing power and memory and uh, how you measure that, those margins. For example, uh, it, it's not acceptable to run out of memory. That should never happen. So you, you, you need built-in build processes into your uh, software to, to actually do that to, and take action based on, uh, for example, uh, I'm close to running out of memory, what I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna handle that. I can't just hard fail because of that. I have to, to be able to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. How do they prove that? Uh, by all those uh, diagrams, the processes, the algorithms, so they, they demonstrate those algorithms exactly how they work, uh, every data control flow that happens, and what will happen, um, it's a very complicated process to, to actually... No, no, I, but a diagram could say that my software works in a way, and the real software works in a different way. No, no, they, 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 ha they give all that, all the information and the software, and they, they're actually tested in simulations to see that it actually uh, it does it that. in a different way. You can think that your software works in one way, but in some situations that you didn't expect or you didn't design, works in a different way. This is what yeah, that, that, that's the thing. That's why it's 100% it's deterministic, because they will know exactly all the situations uh, that will, your software may get in. That's why they don't allow anything that doesn't, that's not, uh, not deterministic. Was there ever an accident because of the bug? Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah. There were situations, no, not accidents exactly, <laughs> uh, situations that the plane went into a bad situation. For example, in Airbus systems, uh, there was uh, a bug that's now been found that uh, the, the plane would end up thinking that it was actually stalling when it was not stalling and it would lower the nose to, to gain back airspeed, but uh, it would never do that because uh, you were cruising and uh, you had uh, a speed of... Uh, 250 knots uh, through airspeed, and uh, it wasn't much uh, as airspeed you could gain. And uh, of course, uh, pilots that, that knew the, the, their systems and how the, the fly-by-wire system worked exactly, knew how to react to that. They, they would disable uh, two of the three ADRU input systems. There are controls uh, above them that can do that. And the, the plane would lose quorum of that uh, critical sensor and would go back to direct low. 
so they would get, get back control and uh, land the plane. No. Or, uh, yes? Uh, I, was, I was gonna say, would they emergency land in that, or would they keep going? Uh, well, uh, they, they could uh, continue flying because uh, if they knew what it is, after the, the first time that happened, the pilots decided to do an emergency landing because they didn't know what caused that. Maybe there, there right. was another major issue with the plane that they were not aware of. But uh, afterwards, there was a, a directive that informed the pilots flying that type of plane that uh, this can happen. If that happens, you need to do that. You can continue flying if you want, or you can land. If the plane is still safe, just uh, bag until uh, it got fixed. Yeah, uh, I ask you because. Uh, I know, not, I'm not sure about these the systems, but I know in real systems they have formal testings, basically spe uh, running specifications, they are trying to do it in a formal way that can prove a lot of uh, scenarios, and they are testing the, the, the software running, not by a diagram or something that you can imagine and you, say, you suppose that your system is going to work. Basically, some real systems you have to uh, provide your formal testing, that is the running specification, specification, and then you can prove that your real system is working. Uh, and the other thing is, at least in Spain, not for commercial planning, but for uh, military things, uh, every time that a plane uh, crashes, they always say, well, what's the software? <laughs> Basically. Yes, uh, th that's the thing, that's the difference with fly-by-wire systems in commercial aviation and uh, military. I said that uh, it got introduced by Airbus in 1988 in commercial aviation, but actually fly-by-wire was, uh, was existing in f fighter jets uh, like decades before that. But there the, the system didn't have all those redundancies, uh, all those specifications. They were just there to, to help the pilot fly the plane better. But they, they didn't care much about safety because the worst case scenario was one person in the cockpit and he could even eject. So it was co completely different, the, the standards that they have to adhere to and uh, the ones that here in commercial aviation. However, uh, what I said no, is not always true because sometimes uh, they always say when the plane press, uh, it was a software problem. And after, I don't know, months and when they have more research, finally it was a mechanic problem. Or <laughs> No, no, that's, uh, that's the thing, that's what they say usually, but the, the, when an accident happens, the people that actually say those things are not the other ones that have all the data, they just like saying stuff. They, it's, it's the usual scare so of... Uh, of cover themselves. No, of course, because, the, <laughs> because uh, the actual report of the investigation will actually contain everything, they, they know exactly the data that they had, that's why we have uh, flight data recorders that you know what happened exactly at the timeline and everything. For example, uh, the, this problem with uh, th thinking that the plane was stolen um, didn't appear until uh, this decade and the plane was flying for over 50 years. So yeah, that's one of the situations where uh, you, you can't really predict and uh, test for everything. But uh, thankfully there are ways to, to take back control of, uh, of your airplane you need to. The, the major uh, thing with uh, that is to, to, to actually understand your, uh, your plane and uh, the, the human uh, and, and computer interface of the plane and uh, n know what's happening and what you can do about it, how to fix it. Because uh, there were situations where they, the pilots couldn't uh, figure that out and uh, they let uh, the plane crash itself. Uh, one of those would be the Asiana, the airlines flight, uh, the triple seven, the crash in San Francisco. Uh, they actually put the plane in a mode that was like it was documented. Uh, the, it, it was known what this mode does. The plane were, uh, were, was actually informed them on the, the display uh, what it was doing, and they let it crash because they didn't understand what uh, what they did exactly told the plane to do. Uh, also, those systems have uh, watchdogs that uh, monitor the hardware and software. That's very important because uh, if something gets frozen for whatever reason, uh, you need a way to, to know that uh, and restart it uh, when it is detected. You don't want to leave it uh, hanging there and waiting for uh, something to happen. 
because uh, with the speed the planes move, it's uh, very important to to actually do do things in a timely manner. Um, the thing that we, we talked about before, and version programming, where they they get uh, the different teams that get the same requirements and they provide different implementations of the, the same of the software that will do the the same things, and uh, having voting that uh, ensures agreement between them about uh, what should happen to its quorum. Uh, the, the, the software has to monitor a card against memory depletion. Uh, so um, the, the memory needs to be managed on uh, software that is written for Avionix and uh, not only managed, but to be aware of the state of uh, how much memory I got free, what I can do next, uh, how I'm going to allocate or deallocate memory, all those things, and uh, to all those processes to be proven that uh, actually happen in the right way. And of course, uh, nothing can be trusted uh, when there is a communication between different processes of uh, uh, Avionics computer system. So to, to check the valid, validity of results and data, they, they, they carry extra metadata with it, uh, check some sensors that uh, can actually confirm that uh, this data is as expected, it's not corrupted, uh, it's correct. And uh, one interesting thing that they have is that uh, when that fails, they have built-in error correction and detection code that first will detect the, uh, that the data is not valid or something's going wrong. And they, they will have to run uh, uh, a recovery blog that will uh, try to, to get uh, the system back to, to a safe state as fast as possible. And if that's not possible to, to do the runtime recovery, then uh, you, you need to, to surface the exception uh, to the top of the system and, uh, uh, and get back to normal, or uh, then uh, just uh, fail hard. Sorry, just I think there's something cut here. That Oh, there it is. Except on the failure of panic, it failed hard. Yeah, this was cut from this um, Yeah, so if you can't uh, recover fast, it's better to, to just fail hard and fail over to the other computer system or uh, to any other load that's required by design. Because, as I said, it's, uh, it's important to, to do things in a timely manner. It's a real time system. It's not uh, something that the, the user can just wait. Uh, for it to happen, if you want to, to roll your plane, you need to roll it right then. You don't want, want to, to wait a couple of seconds or minutes for that to happen. It can be too late. Uh, let's see a bit of other uh, important safety, safety technologies in aviation. Um, so um, there's the flight management system uh, that came along with uh, the, the improved version came along with flight by wire. There was a, a, a predecessor to that that could do some simple things, but uh, this one is uh, is amazing in terms of uh, how it improves safety because it manages to, to reduce the workload of the pilots. Uh, it manages the whole flight plan by having uh, a, a huge database of waypoints, uh, airways, uh, airports, uh, and the runways, along with uh, the standard arrival points of each runway for each airport and the standard. Uh, instrument departure points uh, that can guide the, the airplane throughout the flight and uh, know exactly the limitations like uh, minimal uh, altitude you have to have at uh, that point uh, after takeoff or, uh, or when you go in for landing because there's like terrain that uh, you might hit. Um, and uh, it practically reduces the workload of the pilots to just uh, after uh, after takeoff, uh, to just like uh, doing course correction as instructed by air traffic control, or uh, handover between different uh, uh, flight areas that are controlled by different countries. Then we have uh, TCAS, which is a traffic collision avoidance system. Uh, it, it's very very useful. Uh, uh, what it does, it uh, transmits uh, the correct altitude, speed, and uh, variable speed and heading of the plane. So practically, with those information, uh, 
someone can calculate where that plane is going to be at the next 60 seconds or uh, 5 seconds or whatever. Um, it, it, it receives also the same information from any plane that's in its vicinity. And uh, based on that information, it can uh, figure out if uh, you're going to collide with another airplane in the next uh, 60 seconds. If that happens uh, within 60 seconds, it's going to issue a traffic advisory uh, to both planes that uh, you're in a course collision with uh, another plane. Um, and if, you, if, if it's that to happen within 45 seconds or less, it's going to issue a resolution advisory where uh, it, it, it will uh, say to, to one plane to descend to, and the other to, to, to climb. So th th that's how you can avoid uh, colliding with each other. And uh, this technology is so good and uh, trustworthy that it takes uh, priority over anything else. For example, if, uh, if the air traffic controller tells you to do something else at the same time, you just ignore them. You will do what the system will tell you to do. Next, it's uh, the enhanced ground proximity warning system. It has a terrain database from all, all over the world. And uh, by using GPS uh, and, no, and knowing uh, your, your heading and your speed, you can calculate uh, if you're going to go, go into a mountain, uh, in the south of the mountain, in the next uh, couple of minutes. Uh, and it will advise you to, to, to change your altitude uh, to, to, to safely pass over the, the terrain. It, it actually saved, uh, recently it saved an Air France plane in Africa that was, uh, that it was too low to pass, uh, pass a mountain. Uh, without that system, they would have collided with the mountain. And uh, last but not least, uh, let's see a bit about the monitoring and alerting management on, uh, on a flight-by-wire system. Uh, as I said, uh, nowadays we have the, the glass cockpit where we have digital screens in the cockpit and uh, information can be, ca can be displayed there, uh, centralized. Uh. So we, we have uh, three levels of alerts uh, in, uh, in the planes. Uh, we have the warning, which is something that may affect the plane, but it's not critical enough. Um, or just to, to inform you of an action, just to be aware that happened. For example, when you disconnect the, the autopilot, you get a warning uh, with uh, the message in the central console that the uh, autopilot is connected. So you know that you, this actually happened, you're aware of that fact. You don't think that, uh, you don't accidentally disconnect the, the autopilot and uh, you think that uh, the plane is flown by the autopilot, but it's not actually. Uh, this has happened in the past, before that system. Um, then we have the caution, which is uh, a bit something uh, more uh, dangerous that uh, can cause issues with uh, the safety of the plane. Uh, caution will be raised if uh, you have uh, a problem with the jet engines. Um, like you, you lost uh, pressure, hydraulic pressure for, in one engine, so you need to be made aware of that fact and take uh, the appropriate action. And of course, critical, which is something very, very dangerous and imminent, like a fire to an engine or a sudden uh, loss of pressure of cabin altitude, as it's called, it means the, the, pressure, the pressure inside the, the cabin decreased to, to a dangerous level, leading to decompression. So with the glass cockpit, we have a single point of alert. Um, everything that happens uh, is displayed there in a centralized console. And the best thing about it, uh, um, it's uh, that, that it will also inform you about uh, how to resolve the situation by providing you a checklist to follow. So it's not only just uh, seeing the alerts and uh, all the warnings and cautions. You, you also see what needs to be done to get uh, the plane back to, to a safe state to compensate for uh, what failed. Which is really good when you, you, you have a high workload of uh, something happening that uh, may be like time critical to, to react to. You, you can kindly follow the checklist and uh, get to a safe state again. And of course, uh, you, you, you have the critical issues that will have their own specific. Uh, alert lights and uh, oral warnings and feedback because they're so critical that you really need to they really need to draw your attention to them 
for example, uh, a fire, uh, you have your door lights of, the, of each engine that there's a fire, you need to, to put it out, turn off the engine. Um, then you have the stall where you, you, you will get uh, an oral warning, uh, usually it can be uh, either speed, speed, speed which means your speed is very low, or uh, even stall, depending on the manufacturer of the airplane. Uh, which you, you need to react uh, right away, don't let the, the, the plane get you into a situation where it's, uh, when it's uh, unrecoverable. Uh, it also in some places has uh, feedback on the, the control surface uh, by shaking violently, so you know that uh, this is happening. The same goes for overspeed uh, with your other warning, and of course uh, the TCAS alerts uh, where in, in course collision with another plane where you, you actually need to do something. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions for me, does the um, TCAS system yes. cope? Like, I suppose there's a within a disaster pending. One plane pulls up, so then the other one and then maybe goes down or something. Yes. And then the one which goes up starts to stall. With the, it then well, uh, it, it can uh, negotiate. The thing that, that will happen is that the system will take into account the, uh, the altitude you're on, so it will know if you're in a very high altitude, it will just inform you and it will say to stay there, but it will say to, to the other plane to, to descend more. <laughs> if that happens, uh, yeah. someone has has no, 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 no. has failed so bad that uh, <laughs> I don't know. One way to find out. You should try it. <laughs> Let us know. Let's make it happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow! What are the lesson learned from this? <laughs> what are the lesson learned from this that you want to apply in your daily work? Well, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, fir first of all, in our daily work, uh, lives will, will not be lost if uh, our service <laughs> software fails, uh, if our service fails. In your daily work. Uh, yeah. In your daily work. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they can't say the second floor, there might be a life that is gone. <laughs> At most, you, you will lose money, but uh, no human life. Yeah, yeah the, I guess um, Never it, it, it's very nice to, uh, to have. Uh, Sorry. It's, yeah. it's very nice to have something like uh, co control of what's happening. If it fails to have a, a restore block to, to get you back to, to a good state as uh, fast as possible, this is uh, something that uh, can be implemented um, and uh, not just fail right away with an exception. Uh, it, it will be way more graceful, I guess, for a service to do that, to try to, to actually get back to a good state. I think that we should introduce caution to our sensor. <laughs> yeah. Also, with, with monitoring, <laughs> with monitoring, I believe that uh, we, we tend to like uh, get uh, a lot of things that are not really critical, uh, surface as critical, and uh, then we get used to to seeing critical on a lot of things and uh, start being oblivious to to something that's actually critical, and uh, we need to to do something to fix. I believe that uh, having a better lay way of uh, uh, structuring the the alerts. And uh, the, uh, how critical they are uh, would uh, help us uh, respond better to, to situations of uh, services failing. For example, uh, we could, uh, if, if you have a service that uh, is redundant and uh, it's, it's aware uh, that the redundant copies of the service are aware of each other and they know that one failed, then do not report that it's failed. Just uh, give a warning that, uh, hey, this one failed, but continue working. There's no reason to, to just surface a critical alert that uh, it needs to, action needs to be taken right away because uh, that's not true. How far away are we from 100% soft flying planes, takeoff landing? Uh, well, uh, takeoff. Um, Takeoff is not automatic uh, fully, no. But landing is is automatic mostly, mostly. Um, for example, uh, the plane uh, can guide itself all the way down to the runway, and even apply brakes, and uh, remain uh, on the center line by slowing down. Does that happen every time you land? Is that 
Uh, no, not always. Uh, first of all, the, the runway uh, needs to be uh, cut three to be able to do that. It's a category, the categories cut one, cut two, cut three. Cut three is a category that uh, has the systems. Uh, it's um, a gli glide scope system, also part of the ILS. Uh, it's, it's so uh, detailed uh, in uh, the way that uh, you can, like, uh, Get the plane down to, to the spe exactly specific meter of the runway that uh, can, can actually get the plane to land uh, with an, an intervention. The, the only thing that needs to be done by the pilots, though, that's not 100% automatic. They, they, need, they need to get uh, they need to get the the gear down and uh, slow down the plane a bit uh, based on uh, the position of the plane and also the flaps. The flaps are not uh, automated in any way. What about uh, driving on the ground? This could happen actually, but uh, there's no point to, to just like complicate uh, something like that. Because uh, then you, you would need every single plane to, to be able to do that, otherwise uh, they, they may collide with uh, another plane that's uh, manually controlled at the ground. So no, the 100% automated flight is something that I don't see happening in the next decade, because uh, like uh, self-driving cars, uh, that rely on sensors and uh, proper good data to, to function uh, and we still have accidents and issues because they, they can't predict something uh, for example they have a map of a road and suddenly there are some roadworks they're not good at predicting that and uh, taking action on what to do and uh, imagine that they they, they move uh, in, in two planes uh, where the planes move in three planes which is like uh, way way worse You can fly up to two edges, uh, but with two edges, would you go down to like uh, uh, five, six thousand feet to be able to, to stay stay up? But uh, yeah, no, with that engine, you you would crash. Unless the, unless the airplane has one person in it only. Do you know what like some engine? Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, well, at Heathrow, yeah. uh, all, all, all flights have like ILS uh, yeah. landings because uh, they, they need to be certain that uh, you won't go, do a go around because it would screw the schedule. They, uh, they have so, so, so small little slots that you, you would have a problem. Jimmy. But uh, at, because if you do a go around, then you, you need to take a second turn to, to land. Because ILS is uh, very precise, uh, uh, the only thing that the pilots do usually is they disable the autopilot at uh, 400 feet above ground, uh, okay. but the plane is already like uh, lined up, uh, ready, uh, they say on the right rate, they, they, they can just uh, they do pretty much nothing. It's just like the, the flare uh, that is yeah, for yeah. the touchdown. So that was going to say, I thought so, because I landed at the Gatwick last week. And some dude like, went up to the pilot deck and said, Oh, can you find uh, the pilot? It was a very smooth land. And I was like, I'm pretty sure it was probably yours, mate. Yeah, it depends. It depends on the pilot. Sometimes they, <laughs> yeah. they, they could do it fu fully up, up to that down, could be fully automated, but, or they could just like disable. Usually they disable the pilot for 100 feet and uh, yeah. take control, yeah. because that, that counts for them, that counts as doing a minor landing. Yeah. 
which they, they need to do a, a certain number of those uh, every year. Zero yeah. yeah. right. items. How often do you have failures on these systems? Uh, since uh, that was introduced, uh, there's never been a case when uh, the secondary computer, SEC, that controls elevators and elevators failed as well. So the, the first one, uh, there's been cases where it has failed, but uh, you went to the secondary one. Because so never a complete outage. No, complete outage never happened. Oh. So it's not his job, right? Kids Oh, fucking hell. Bloody bells. <laughs>